Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining once again for the Monks podcast. Hare Krishna. My pleasure. Nice to be with you. Continuing our series of Dash Avatar. Yes, Maharaj. This is going on very relishably. And today we are going to discuss Parashuram. It's quite a fierce and sometimes confusing manifestation of the Lord. In some ways, yes. all, the, all the manifestations of the Lord, in some ways they cross ethical boundaries or at least they appear to cross ethical boundaries. And yeah. I think that happens in the most, uh, you could say sweet way in Krishna. We'll come to that, but in Parashuram it is there. So <laughs> with Parashuram, it's the most ghastly way. <laughs> yeah, ghastly, yes. True. <laughs> So, you know, like the past, we could just go over the narrative and we'll discuss, and then whatever points come up, we will. I suggest. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, I suggest we start with the, the verse from Das Avatar Stotra. Oh, sure. Kshatriya Rudhira Maye Jagadapagata Papam. Snapayasi payasi shamita gavatapam keshavadrita brigupati rupa jaya jagadisha hari hare o keshava o lord of the universe o lord hari who have assumed the form of brigupati harusharama all glories to you at Kurukshetra, you bathe the earth in the rivers of blood from the bodies of the demoniac kshatriyas that you have slain. The sins of the world are washed away by you. And because of you, people are relieved from the blazing fire of material existence. Beautiful, yes. Yesterday, I believe, was the Tirubhav Titi of Jayadev Goswami, Sripad Jayadev Goswami. And uh, it's nice to remember him on this occasion. And it's interesting, I find, that he began his Gita Govinda with the Dashavatara Stotra, because it has such a different sort of style, you might say, from from the rest of the song. Yeah. In some ways he It's also it's also I believe uh, Jayadev Goswami is to be credited with uh, popularizing the this idea of 10 avatars of Dasha avatar. Yes. Um, because of course in different accounts there are different lists of Avatars, uh, the Bhagavatam has different lists and so on, and there are generally more. And then with Jayadev, we have specifically 10 avatars. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, I don't know what historians say, but I think they say uh, that this marks the time from which we have this idea of 10 avatars as prominent as sort of main main avatars of Vishnu. Oh, okay. Yes. And yeah. number six is Parashurama. Yeah. So uh, actually I was going to come to this when you mentioned this. This is also one reason why it is somewhat, uh, you could say ghastly, Kshatriya Rudharmaya. Mm, so he's got the blood like rivers to flow. You bathe the earth in rivers of blood from the bodies of demoniac kshatriyas that you have slain. So it seems that uh, this, the broad Vedic texts are not uh, squeamish or apologetic about violence. And nowadays in today's world, religious violence is a matter of great concern. 
but there is there is almost a celebratory tone associated with violence that since this warrior is so glorious that by the way he shot arrows rivers of blood flowed so that can rivers of blood rivers of blood are flowing and heads are rolling <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes it even more mm. now i read one in one you could say critic or whatever there are a lot of christian missionaries who uh, try to who are very active in converting in india so now mm-hmm. there is violence in the bible also in the old testament not so much in the new testament but they say that this scale of violence is uh, not seen and now you could argue about various things but the but the celebratory tone about violence it seems that uh, it is maybe we are perceiving from a particular cultural context and the scriptures are written in a different cultural context that's why that this may jar some of us but it may not jar anyone who is reading from a traditional perspective you like to comment on that um i haven't thought about it quite that way but um i was thinking more in terms of rasa theory um where we have indeed a sort of ghastliness which indeed as you say is seems to be practically celebrated um and i'm reminded of the fact that we are attracted or many people are attracted to horror stories or horror films um but what i find when i read about parashuram making rivers of blood and making heads roll is the tone is not really horror it's yeah. it's not you don't feel you don't feel a ch- a cold chill go down your spine um oh sure, yeah it it's more like i don't know what it is <laughs> it's more of virya ras you know it's not so much of yeah yanka yeah. yeah it's heroism more than horror and and it's good you mention that because i just came across this point um in a book which is a translation of the gita govinda but it has a kind of extended introduction and um and it's mentioned indeed that for this particular verse of the dash avatar stotra uh it's a kind of instruction that says while depicting parashurama vira drishti should be used this is referring i think to like in a dance performance hmm because the gita govinda is performed uh and particularly as dance and so vira drishti would be you know particular way of sort of sharply looking with the eyes yeah so i think it's as you say it's predominantly vira vira rasa um but we don't usually think of vira rasa as you know visions of blood flowing everywhere i don't know it's almost like violence that's gone so um so over the top you know that it's it, it's 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 reminding us that this is um it's beyond all human scale and therefore also it's beyond all human scale of uh ethical judgment oh beautiful that's a, it that's seems a very... like so now we see similar descriptions even in the mahabharat seven arjuna is especially penetrating into the kaurava army on the 30 on the 14th day when he wants to neutralize jaydrath 
who's responsible for abhiman use death and uh, it's not so much in the ramayana although it's there but n- not that much mm. so there's also in mahabharata the well two two occasions i'm thinking of uh, one is the burning of the kandava forest yeah which uh, there the violence is against the trees and the animals so it seems like a completely anti ecology yeah event and in fact if i remember mm, the animals are forced to stay within the forest they want to flee but they're not allowed to they're forced to be burned yeah that's true in fact it said over there that arjuna is actually fighting on three fronts you know one is that he is fighting with the devtas who are trying to protect the forest from being burnt especially headed by indra then arjuna is created like a umbrella with his arrows around the forest so is the devtas are attacking that umbrella and he is replacing that and also krishna is taking him round and round so anybody who is trying to escape he is preventing yeah. them from escaping Yeah yeah. <laughs> so so the only And then the yeah sorry. The, the other uh sort of uh uncontained violence event is of course Ashvatthama uh going into the Pandava camp after the after the battle after the war and murdering uh just you know without restriction he's just murdering the sons of and the pandavas and so on yeah so now that's both of them are really uh, they're po- graphic examples but overall the mahabharat stone with respect to the seconds does seem to be condemnatory it is you know before he goes there kripa kripacharya who is with him at that time says what he thinks saying cannot even be thought of what to speak of being doing it and then mm. so at least that is there it is considered reprehensible so often i say that in sometimes people try to equate the violence in the mahabharat with with say the violent religious extremism today they say if there is anything which is like that it's ashwatthama's killing the kurukshetra yeah. war was actually fought, never fought no civilians were targeted it was warriors fighting with warriors so mm. unarmed civilians being targeted like happens in terrorism today that is yeah. the nearest that comes the, the kurukshetra main violence is not like that ashwatthama's violence and that is actually it is condemned in the mahabharata that's not the, at all the recommended way of fighting mm. yes also with with parashuram he is killing kshatriyas he's not doesn't say that he was uh killing anyone else yeah that's also so and also it is said that they they are demonic kshatriyas and mm. if we look at the context even for uh, the the khatriya the protectors become predators then uh, somebody has to act as i teach them a lesson so who is going to do that mm. it seems in uh, modern political philosophy whatever is, they say that the government should have a monopoly on the use of violence that not nobody else mm. should use that but if the government is becoming violent against ordinary citizens or against kshatriyas then who is going to who is going to defend them that this is uh this is the basic <clears throat> argument as far as i know uh for this what is it uh second amendment in the us constitution the the people who are defending uh the gun rights the so- the yeah the rights to carry arms uh so this was considered foundational for uh for the US government that people can have their own arms and uh, this is what they're arguing and yeah. then now in, at, too frequently there is some uh serial killer event or some terrorist event and then everyone gets excited right. and says we have to make some restrictions some gun laws and then the gun manufacturers and the um 
National Rifle Association, because they're such a powerful lobby, lobby they silence it. It, it always, always happens. It happens again and again. Um, and they always point to the Second Amendment, where the argument or the reason for it is that uh, citizens have to be able to defend themselves, um, possibly against uh, state-sanctioned state violence. Yeah. And so it goes. It's true. It's Meanwhile, the violence increases. Yeah. It's, it seems that this was, that amendment was made after the American battle for independence because at that time, the British government, which was ruling, that was exploitative. And the American history, there seems there was some battle of Luxembourg where they fought primarily to get gunpowder. And if the British, go, British army had gone that gunpowder, they would have crushed the revolution. But they managed to defend it and they managed to protect that village and they got uh -huh. the gunpowder themselves. And that's how this, what they say was like a, a disorganized, unarmed band of revolutionaries were able to win against the biggest emperor yeah. at, the empire, at that time. Yeah. So from that time, they have... You know right. your history. Sorry? You know your history better than... I, you know your American history better than I do. <laughs> no, nothing like that. Actually, but it wasn't. It wasn't Luxembourg. It wasn't Luxembourg. It was well, it must have been Lexington. <laughs> oh, okay. It's just a detail. Oh, <laughs> Luxembourg is, is in Europe. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anuttama Prabhu actually told me this when we were discuss discussing. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So yeah, so. One thing about, okay, you wanted to go through a, um, a kind of uh, action scene, what happens with the pastime of Harasharam. Why don't you go ahead? Yes, ma'am. Just before that, you mentioned the other pastime of Kandava. You know, probably that does seem in today's world quite jarring, the anti-environmental thing. So the only way I, I find it reasonable explanation is that explain that the Mahabharata is not just happening at the terrestrial level. It's actually, there is things happening at a cosmic level also. And the beings residing over there are considered to be, are considered to be demoniac. And that's why that destruction is happening. And the Pandavas, there are other incidents where say, for example, when the Pandavas are living in the forest, Vyasadeva comes and tells them, don't stay in this place for too long. If you stay too long and you take too many fruits and other things from here, you will disrupt the ecology over here. So keep moving. So it's not like a complete anti-environmental ethos in the Mahabharat. So you have any other explanations, Maharaj, for this? Uh, nothing better than what you just said. So I feel some relief. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was worried about that. <laughs> Thank you. But there is something of a there is something of an echo um, in the kind of a forest burning i i'm feeling uh with uh with the uh jana Mejaya's snake sacrifice oh okay there's there's a sense in which you know there is a very intentional destruction of of living beings although with the kind of a forest there's there's no cause other than Agni's hunger, right? He wants, to, he wants to have a good meal, so that's that's all. But uh, of course, uh, Janamejaya is uh, wanting revenge against Tar Takshaka for killing his father. Yeah. Uh, therefore, you know, we're we're going to get Takshaka, and we're going to get all the other snakes. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And then we have another echo of that in the Bhagavatam with Daksha going after the Yakshas because one Yaksha Ooh. killed his brother. Now he's going to kill all the Yakshas. Yeah. So, so violence, even if it is, I mean, so each of these could be contextualized in different ways. Yeah. But there's some amount of, uh, 
indiscriminateness to the violence that comes up mm yeah yeah but then most of the times except for ashwatthama nobody stops him with respect to agni it's agni's hunger but agni also says that there itself that there are all these this forest is populated by demoniac beings so in that sense there's some contextualization yes aha uh-huh. yes. okay yes so yes so if we go over the past time now so overall yeah. what what the, if that prashuram's violence is is not indiscriminate it's not against everyone it's only against kshatriyas and there is reason for it which as we go through the narrative will come up mm. so this is described in the ninth chapter ninth canto of the bhagavatam this basically chapters 15 and 16 which talk about this uh, prashuram's past time and the whole the, here at least the description begins with quite an interesting explanation of why he is how a person with a kshatriya spirit is born in a brahmana family and uh, so it does seem in the vedic times that people would be born more or less according to their dispositions but in this case the story goes that uh, you would like to tell that maharaj should i quickly go over it you go ahead okay so the, there was a king gadhi who had a daughter named satyavati and richika was a sage who wanted to marry uh, marry his daughter so then he arranged for a big dowry for her and then it's interesting here the king asks the sage that you have to give a dowry so it's more like a bride price he says that give at least 1000 yeah. 1000 horses so richika the, the word is still used as dowry at his proper translates a dowry but then he gets that and then he gets married to her and then both each okay. horse has to have a black ear right yeah <laughs> he just brilliant <laughs> as as a moonshine and each having one one black ear either left or right so some concession is given <laughs> 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 so then after that it seems that ruchik uh, both his wife and his mother in law both desire a son and then they offer him they ask him to perf- perform some yagya do some oblation and he gives ob- prepares oblation for both of them and then he goes out to bathe so at that time his mother in law uh, she thinks that so so now here first time the, the, the daughter's name is mentioned is satyavati so satyavati's mother mother says that you know you give your offering to me because she thinks that he will have prepared a better offering for his own son rather than for anyone else so then they for his daughter off. yeah yeah so yeah i mean for his for his own offspring basically for so through yeah. his wife so then when they do that then he comes back and he says that you have done a wrong because he tells his wife that you know, for her oblation i had arranged that she would get a kshatriya son and for your oblation had arranged that you would get a brahmana son now you will get a kshatriya son who will who will kill everyone and your brother will be a scholar so when she begs for forgiveness and she says okay not your son but your grandson so her son is so satyavati son is jamadagni and jamadagni's son is uh, per, is born as parshuram so jamadagni marries renuka and then parshuram is born from there so and it, as, as i understand Renuka uh is the daughter of a king so she's a kshatriya Oh okay just mention the daughter of Renu over here mm. Yes but the implication must be that she's a kshatriya So that the kshatriya son could be born from her is that what you're saying Well you can say like that um the point is as i understand the the what it comes down to is it's a mixture it's he's he's brahman and kshatriya but the the kshatriya spirit prevails you can say yes so so you are saying that their marriage itself must have been slightly the anulom pratilom it would be it would be i think pratilom 
for a brahmana to marry a kshatriya brahmana man to marry a kshatriya wife but either way so there's no purport to this verse by prabhupad but it does yeah. see, seem that when there is some kind of uh, deviation from the norm there is a reason given for that so generally mm. if the culture was uh, if the culture was somewhat stratified and people were there not much intermarriage happening between the varnas or here in one sense already the inter, intermarriage has happened between the kshatriya and a brahmana but kshatriya Shatri, uh, daughter and a Bra- kshatriya girl and a brahmana man but it is presumed that their progeny would be a brahmana not a kshatriya but in mm. this case things change so in some ways the the transcendental manifests through the genealogical and there is there is we could find explanations at different levels so the lord comes yeah. in, independent of any material causation he can come however he wants but then he comes accord, he there might be some material explanation also given for certain things or some material yeah. or co- contextual explanation yeah <clears throat> Yes. In a similar way to, uh, somewhat similar, that uh, Krishna is, Krishna's two Bhagavan Svayam, he's the original Supreme Lord, uh, but he appears in this world through Lord Vishnu. Yes. So, yeah, yeah so Vishnu is the inter- maintainer, so people pray to Vishnu. and then in response to that prayer he appears so we could say there is a the lord also seems to respond to so there is a there seems to be a mat, mat, response to a material situation when he is appearing and there is also his transcendental will by which he appears yeah although with parashuram there is no prayers mentioned people are not praying for parashuram to appear <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's a interesting observation if we go back for which all avatars the prayers are happening for the appearance till now if we discussed if we start with matsya as he himself it's more like proactive there is going to be a pralay and he himself comes yeah. then kurma is he's prayed for but it's not expected he's going to appear in that form Okay. Yes. So you're saying his prayed form in the sense that when the mandar power sink, sink, starts sinking, they expect some help from him, from the Lord. Yeah, that... they need help. Yeah. Yes. And then we have uh, Varaha. Not exactly again a prayer. With Varaha also, he, just, he also just kind of appears when Lord Brahma is thinking what to do. Yeah. So he could take the thinking as. sort of the beginning steps of prayer and then the lord just says uh, that's beautiful in effect don't you don't have to waste you don't have to waste your time i'll just come <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there are prayers for all the avatars more or less after they appear satyavrat yeah. satyavrat muni offers some prayers then kurma are there prayers specifically offered to kurma and they they are all very busy i think cherni so yeah and then after that they're celebrating and fighting over the nectar so yeah so varaha there are prayers offered brahma ji offers prayers yeah. and asks him please my dear lord hurry up now mm-hmm. so and then nrsimhade so nrsimhade after after hiranyakashipu is dispatched then the prayers of the demigods and prahlad so in all the hiranyakashipu is terrorizing the world um the devatas do they specifically pray to vishnu for help it is more like the devatas try to uh, kill uh, the child of kayadu and narad muni comes and says he is going to yeah. be your deliverer no i'm saying after everything is over yeah, so, so, yeah their prayers after of course i just wondering whether yeah. their prayers before also hmm. Hmm. not specifically as far as i remember yeah <laughs> it seems like the classic case of prayers requesting the lord to appear is specifically for lord krishna oh 
yeah the, at least the whole detail narrative is there so even for ramayana also there is no description in the ramayana valmiki ramayana although there is this there are some songs about lord ram there is ram stotra shat naam and naam ramayana mm. where they say that that the devatas prayed to vishnu at the side of the kshira sagar but there is no description uh-huh. like that in the in the ramayana per se as far as i have read it aha uh-huh. okay then we have of course i don't think for buddha or kalki there are any prayers as such so <laughs> only krishna that's nice parshuram there is not parshuram so are any prayers offered to parshuram per se any time in his life oh i don't know about at least i don't see in the bhagavatam not in the bhagavatam but of course but of course there's a there's quite a large tradition of parashuram connected with uh culture in kerala yes it's con- the whole that landmass is considered to be reclaimed by parashuram it's co- it's yes so i would assume that there's lots of um a lot of literature connected with parashuram in kerala maybe yes. in malayalam language i don't know there's a book uh which has just come out very recently called the second rama uh oh, okay. it's a study of the of the many accounts of uh the story of parashuram and it's basically tracing how the story of parashuram develops over time how it develops and changes so it's uh yeah it's not a devotional book it's a more of an analytical yeah. approach <laughs> it's not right so in some ways through the analytical through this kind of analytical books we might get some information but then eventually what is what is nourishing for our dev- devotion what is compatible with our devotional traditional understanding we'll have to glean it carefully yeah that's not right mm-hmm. so with that background now when he, he appears it it seems that not all his all their sons are of a kshatriya disposition he is youngest and he seems to be the only one having the kshatriya disposition and mm. uh, is he actually when he exhibits a lot of kshatriya qualities also that way when his uh, father jamadagni is angry with renuka so because renuka gets attracted to gandharva for a few moments and mm. then he says kill her and then he asks his elder uh, his older sons to kill they say they hesitate and he says kill them also yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which um i have a i i stumbled on that because um it seems like an inconsistency on jamadagni's character because just before this at the end of the previous chapter jamadagni is scolding parashuram for killing um uh, what's his name uh kartaviraajuna <laughs> huh karti yes Hmm. Kartaviryarjuna sorry i'm yeah thinking of ashvatama and whatever uh yeah he comes back you know saying dad look what i did and dad <laughs> chamadagni says that's not good you know we are we are brahmanas we are forgiving we are peaceful shanti 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 and then immediately after this happens this um episode with with the wife renuka and suddenly he's he's where's the forgive forgiving quality that was there before yeah it's it somehow it does seem that at least in i don't know whether it is a, a ethos of the times but uh, lack of chastity or even uh, consideration of lack of chastity seems to be considered to be a very serious offense and uh, 
we see something similar in the ramayana when there is ahalya and gautam rishi so ahalya has so indra gets attracted to ahalya and gautam rishi he impersonates as gautam rishi yeah and then he comes and they unite and when gautam rishi comes to know then he curses both indra and ahalya so yeah his body gets covered with uh, his body gets deformed and he gets Uh, reproductive organs, female reproductive organs, all over his body, and <laughs> Ahalya yeah. turns into a stone. Yes. <laughs> you know, so the, so actually, I have been I have been writing a book on the Rama and so I did a little research because this story is often used as a uh, as a example of you know how women were exploited. Mm-hmm. So it said that Ahalya was simply the victim of one man's lust and another man's anger. So Indra's lust mm-hmm. and her husband's anger. but then if i read the ramayan carefully and look at some of the ramayan commentaries there's one significant detail which is not told in the stories is that ahalya herself was a yogini and she recognized that this is not my husband this is indra oh but she felt that she felt so in a sense feminine pride that the king of gods is going through so much trouble just to be with me and then she she gave into that pride or that moment of weakness because of that hmm so now of course the story has a happy ending in the sense that lord ram touches her touches her uh, and transforms her and restores her there has to be a happy ending <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so overall it it does seem that chastity is a very serious consideration and not only I- not only in indian culture but uh traditional culture generally in ancient israel um adultery was uh was a capital offense yeah, but it was a capital offense i don't think it was a capital offense for the man but it was for the woman so it was a it was a very one-sided thing yeah i think they were to stone to death and that's why when when jesus mother became pregnant without her husband as a virgin as virgin then there was some suspicion initially because of that mm. and then afterwards so yes so in my understanding i mean it is it some aspects of the traditional culture seem to be as you said biased in a particular way I say uh, but it was just uh, it could be in my understanding the societal arrangement to protect social order because ultimately a woman when she gets a woman is going to bear a child and usually the idea was that uh, uh, union is likely to lead to childbirth and if that union is going to happen outside the marriage then it is going to lead to a lot of problems so uh, so at one level the men are also there was polygamy where the men could take men were expected to take responsibility for if they were to marry many people or if they if they are going to, if the king is going to unite with a maid servant also they expected to maintain but then yeah. if is already marriage is there then there has to be some amount of uh, civilizing restraint otherwise society so otherwise just when I mean, violence can easily break about so of course i am not i know that this is not a like a complete explanation or a completely satisfying explanation but one thing is that social order had to be maintained and especially when sex is to be was like say union was going to likely to lead to procreation so then some amount of regulation was important Hmm. Well, yes, um, but it does seem like an overreaction, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. That is true. You know, so, for, so you know, there was there was no discussion. There was no like, um, you know, what were you doing? What was? How come you're late? Uh, <laughs> none of that. <laughs> Nothing yeah. at all. Just cut off her head. It's quite, yeah, that's true. Quite. Ex- that is true man. there are other versions 
there are other versions or we can say details uh, I came across about uh, Renuka, um, which sort of highlights why this was significant that her, mm, her chastity seemed to be ever so slightly compromised was that uh, her chest, she was so known for her chastity that she, she had a pot for water which was made of sand. In other words, it was an unbaked, oh, it was an unbaked pot or somehow was not what, it was not what you would normally hold water in. So when she goes to the river, uh, I guess to the Ganga, to, to, get, to get water uh, for her husband, for worship, whatever it was, and then she is distracted in this way by the Gandharva, or in another version uh, by uh, Kart. Kartaviryarjuna, Kartavirya. Oh, really? Okay. Um, her sand pot, so to say, begins to leak. Oh, okay. Just as she's, you know, slightly contemplating this, uh, this male <laughs> as an object of attraction or the fact that he's enjoying with these apsaras, his I think the version in the Bhagavatam, uh, you know, there's some, some wavering which becomes evident in the pot leaking. Oh, okay. And then the pot basically collapses. She no longer has this pot of water. And then when she comes back, it's very clear to her husband that she, she is no longer... Uh, holding her chastity in the way she was before. Anyway, that's yeah, it's that I know part of the story. But my my point is that the reaction of Jamadagni seems really over the top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just just cut off her head. Uh, that's that's pretty intense. Yeah, that's true. It seems that overall the ninth canto, among all the cantos in the Bhagavatam, the ninth canto has quite a few provocative stories about human sacrifices yeah. and sages. A lot of things happen in the ninth canto. Yes. Which are quite, mm, we could say, morally complex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could put it that way, morally complex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of what's in the ninth canto are kind of summaries of stories in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, isn't it? Of course, the Ramayana is summarized in two chapters before this. Yeah. Um, but then there's various stories, including what we're reading now, um, I think is also in Mahabharata, isn't it? Yes. Mahabharata has a lot of ancillary stories and conversations where a lot of previous stories are talked about. So yeah, so a lot different. of that is summarized in the ninth canto. Yes. Uh, because, which goes to, I think, what, what Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying, that uh, the Bhagavatam is collecting together everything essential from all the Vedic literature. And he famously wrote in that essay on the Bhagavata in uh, 1869 that uh, all of the Vedic literature, if you extract, if you take the Bhagavatam, you keep the Bhagavatam, and you let all the Vedic literature, other than the Bhagavatam, be burned, like he, he compares it to the, uh, the fire of the Alexandria Library. Okay. ancient library famously completely burned down said if you'd have such a fire of Vedic literature nothing would be lost 
<laughs> oh. it says nothing would be lost because you have the Bhagavatam. He was being a bit hyperbolic, but it's an interesting point he's making. And the basic idea is that the Bhagavatam is summarizing uh, the essentials so that mm, uh, for practical reasons, you only need one book. You don't have to carry a whole library with you if you're a traveling uh, mendicant, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, beautiful. So, of course, now the Bhagavatam itself is a big library, also, which is Prabhupada's purports. Yeah. He, yes, it's well, yes, then you add the purports again, and then you have this huge multi volume book. Yeah. Yeah. I had also but, read some, somewhere that it's like the fifth canto. I think, I don't know if the Bhakti Mataku says this, but it says the fifth canto is meant to weed out the faithless people. So, the, the faith kind of people read the cosmology and then if they don't able to put put it aside they're too too rationalistic then the fifth canto will block them if they're too moralistic the ninth canto will block them i don't know whether this is what bhakti thakur has said but i've heard this oh. in, a, in a class i i don't know it sounds interesting <laughs> yeah hmm. Yes, Maharaj. So it's sometimes I feel that certain pastimes are are just described or they have a purpose in terms of glorifying a particular character. So for glorifying that character, sometimes other characters may say sort of act out of character. So to glorify Parshuram's presence of mind and his intelligence, the the over-the-top reaction of Jamadagni is there. I think there is a, not exactly similar, but in the Old Testament, there is a story where God asks, uh, whom is it? He asks him, to, is it Jacob to give his sacrifices? Abra Abraham. Abraham. Abraham should sacrifice his son Isaac. Yeah, so, and he, it's, it's something which is, and he has got that son after a very, very long time in old age, unlikely. And then God asks him to sacrifice it. And then finally God intervenes to an angel and tells him, you know, this, like, this was a test. So yeah. in some ways, we can say that, what had Isaac done? Why is he being sacrificed like that? But, yeah. and why would God also demand something like that? It's in some ways to glorify Abraham's willingness to sacrifice what is most dear to him. So yeah. maybe we could see it that way that, like in this, that this whole past, pastime is to glorify Parshuram's presence of mind. Because in the seventh canto, if you see that it is said, uh, Narad Muni was also submitting to Hiranyakashipu. Or even the Devtas are in Brahmaji and Lakshmi are not able to pacify, pacify Narasimha Dev, but Prahlad is able to pacify. Hmm. So it seems that when a particular character is to be glorified, uh, at that time, other characters may be placed somewhat in in some what uncharitable role, no, not uncharitable, unflattering roles. Mm. That's a good way to, that, that kind of helps, I think. Um, I mean, <clears throat> one might come back though and ask, is this really a glorification of Parashuram that he is you say you say it's showing his presence of mind. Someone could criticize and say it's showing his foolishly blind obedience. Yeah, the, I, old, the older sons, the older sons hesitate, and we think, well, yeah, I would too. <laughs> I would also hesitate. Not only would I hesitate, I would say, Dad, will you please calm down? <laughs> Dad. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, just cool down and understand this is not what we do uh, to what you do to your, your wife and our mother. Um, but they're just hesitant. But then Parashuram is not hesitant. I wanted to look for... 
There's a purport. Um, Prabhupada speaks about this. Let's see. Um, I think it, the way it is a glorification is that he knows that his father has the power to revive even if he kills. And with that, he, yeah. he knows that he can't, that when his father is angry, he can't stop the anger. But he can actually get his father to undo the consequences of that anger. That's why so it's not yeah. like a blind obedience. It's, we could say, making the best of a bad situation by going along with okay. it. Okay. Uh, here's the verse and purport. Uh, number is it? I'll just share the screen. Yeah, verse number, uh, this is chapter 16. Yeah. Verse 6. Verse 6, okay. Rama Sanchodita Pitra Bratrin Matra Sahavarit Prabhavagnya Mune Samyak Samadhe Tapasascha Saha Jamadagni then ordered his youngest son Parashurama to kill his brothers who had disobeyed this order and his mother who had mentally committed adultery, Lord Parashurama, knowing the power of his father, who was practiced in meditation and austerity, killed his mother and brothers immediately. Purport, the word prabhavagnya is significant. Parashuram knew the prowess of his father and therefore he agreed to carry out his father's order. He thought that if he refused to carry out the order, he would be cursed. But if he carried it out, his father would be pleased. And when his father was pleased, Parashuram would ask the benediction of having his mother and brothers brought back to life. Parashuram was confident in this regard, and therefore he agreed to kill his mother and brothers. <laughs> so yeah, I guess in this account, uh, we can say Parashuram is glorified because for two reasons. One, uh, you can say the more mundane reason is obedience to the father, mm. which is also celebrated in the Ramayana, although it's also, in a sense, questioned in the Ramayana. If you're too obedient, that's also not good. Um the Chinese tradition has something to say about that. Um, but that's another story. Uh, that, so his obedience is one thing, but his second qualification, recognizing his father's powers, he immediately knows that he's going to be, a, he's going to please his father. Therefore, he'll be able to uh, get a benediction and he'll be able to ask his father uh, to put all the heads back on. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> to replace To replace the heads and bring them back to life. That's, uh, that's another topic also which maybe should be considered is how much, first of all, what, uh, the fact that there's so much decapitation going on Within this account, uh, it starts with Kartavir Yarjuna losing his head. Hmm. And then uh, Renuka loses her head. And eventually, Jamadagni loses his head. Yeah. And then, um, and then Parashuram makes quote, a mountain of heads when he goes back and uh, begins his genocide against the Kshatriyas. He makes, a, it said, he makes a mountain of heads. Um, and then we have the head cutting program uh, in the fourth canto of, um, of uh, Daksha. Daksha loses his head. I always like to say Daksha lost his head, both literally and physically. Oh, beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Daksha lost his head both ways. Yeah. He lost his head, you could say, non-literally first and then literally later. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's uh, and then uh, Ganesha loses his head, and each time another head gets put back. In the case of Daksha, it's a goat head. In the case of uh, Ganesh, it's a it's an elephant head. But uh, with Renuka, she gets her proper head back. Such fact, and the, the, and also the the uh, the sons, the brothers of Parashram, they each get their heads back, um, and don't seem to know that anything happened. Yeah, that's it's significant. Just, that, I never thought of this in terms of decapitation, that specifically the head being killed, head being cut off for killing. So, and of course, Shishupa loses his head to Krishna. Yeah, does the Bhagavatam say that her that head is decapitated because he says just kill this woman, kill this sinful woman. Vyavicharam munir gyatva patnya prakupito abravit nhatainam putrakaha papam itti uktas tena chakrire. So, gnatainam. Gnata is kill. I think maybe in the other, you said the other literature, it might be specifically decapitating. Yeah, and also, doesn't it say. Um... I don't have it here, but <clears throat> I'm sure uh, here. No, you're right. It doesn't mention about specifically the head, but else elsewhere, I think that's yeah. the tradition that he cuts off the head. Um, and then it says when they're brought back to life, it's as if awakened from sound sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now, okay, so just going back to one earlier point which you mentioned about obedience. Mm. So you said that some uh, even how much to obey, you're saying something about that in Ramayana also it is questioned. So, well, I'm, I'm I'm saying that uh, everyone is very, very much upset that Rama has uh, determined that he's going to be obedient uh, to Dasharat. Even Dasharat doesn't want him to listen to him. Yeah. But he's determined to be obedient. Bharata is against it. The whole Ayodhya is against his obedience. But mm -hmm. Rama insists. And okay. you can say, you can say, and that's when all the trouble starts. You know, he he insists on being uh, obedient. That means he's going to the forest. That means all the trouble that happens. <laughs> but of course, yeah, we understand this is the Lord's arrangement, and so on. Yeah, to rid of the world ultimately of Ravana. Yeah. So yes, my right. So now. It but does... more generally, we might also reflect on fathers and sons in the Bhagavatam. That's an interesting reflection. In one of our Hiranyakashibu earlier talks, Hiranyakashibu and Prahlad. Sorry. In one of your earlier talks. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. Hiranyakashipu and Prahlad, of course, is a father's. It's a, it's a troubled relationship. Uh, Brahma and the four Kamaras is a troubled relationship. That's interesting, yeah. Mm. Even Dhruva and Uttanapada is at least sometime troubled. Yes. Mm. What else? Yeah. Those three are clearly troubled. Mm. And there are others which are not troubled. So, yeah. Um, Swayambhuva Manu is a very obedient son to Lord Brahma. Uh, the only problem being that he has nowhere to realize 
to, to perform what Lord Brahma has asked him to do. And that's why Varaha Deva has to come. Hmm. That's all right. Mm. So, so here, when the obedience is depicted and he pleases him, and then they are revived. So it seems that uh, that incident is completely blotted from the memory. And uh, then the sons of Vakarthi uh, Virajuna uh, come to take, uh, to take revenge for their father's killing. So it, this, this yeah. I would say is an indication that it is not just like one rotten apple, but it's almost like the entire bunch of apples is rotten. So it was at one level, when any conflict starts, you know, we can keep tracing it backward to say who started the conflict and he said, you did this first and you did that first and you did that first. It can go on. But it does seem that Kartavir Arjuna started the whole thing first by stealing the Kamadhinu cow of the, of the sage Jamadagni. It all started with a cow. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so it must be the cow's fault. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> oh. Yeah, you know, it's a. If you want to scapegoat a cow, is there a word scape cow? <laughs> scape cow. Oh no! <laughs> Any idea why it is a scapegoat? Was it like not a? Uh, I think it doesn't it come from ancient Israelite tradition of uh, sacrificing a goat. Oh, okay. That's true. Mm, so, yeah, it's in the Day of Atonement, they used to offer a, a cow, a, a goat, a symbolic bearer of the sins of the people. The goat was sent into the wilderness. Okay, so we could we could scapegoat the cow, but so at least from a reasonable perspective, it is Kartavi Rajuna who starts it, and then Parshuram goes and without even giving an opportunity to return, ask him for returning the cow or returning the cow, Kartavi Rajuna attacks him, and then he Parshuram kills him. So now they are coming, and here what they do is quite brutal. No, they they kill the sage and although Renuka is begging save his spare his life, they do nothing and that really sets Parshuram off. So, hmm. so now he's actually defending his mother. Yeah, in a sense, he's he's being vengeful uh, on behalf of his mother. We might say. Yeah. So in in many times. If you look in our scriptures, the apparent aggressor is actually is not the actual aggressor. Like the Kurukshetra war, it is called by the Pandavas. In one sense, Ram is going and attacking the attacking Lanka. But actually, it is something else which Ravan has done or the Kauravas have done beforehand. So mm. who is who is in one sense shooting the first arrow or calling for the war? And who has caused the war are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then Parshuram decides that the whole Kshatriya dynasty has to be taught a lesson. And not just for one dynasty, but it said 21 generations. Not one, not two, not three, not four. He just keeps going. Yeah. It seems 21 generations, whenever generations are talked about, 21 seems to be like a common figure when the seventh. Yeah. Seventh canto, when it is said that uh, Narasimha Dev says Prahlad Maharaj that Trisaptha Pita Puta, that 21 generations yes. of a pure devotee's uh, yes. descendants would be liberated. I've thought about that. I've wondered about that too. What's so special about 2021? 20, something about three times seven is very special. Yeah. But I've also wondered with these Kshatriyas, generations of Kshatriyas, You'd think that after you'd think that after three or four generations, all the kshatriyas would say, "Now wait a minute. This is 
we're, we're all in trouble uh, if we think, you know, Parashuram is not going to wipe us out. Uh, so we better make some plan to stop. But you don't hear about any plans to stop Parashuram. It seems like almost, uh, it's, it's like uh, there's no resistance. Yeah. So their kshatri kshatriyas, you would think, are going to really fight, um, but they don't. You don't hear about them doing any resistance against Parashuram. It's almost like, "Come and take us. We are kshatriyas. <laughs> we need to be wiped out." <laughs> hmm. Now, now is it is it literal? In because the Bhagavatam, at least. Traditionally, uh, traditionally within Iskon, when I grew up, we always took everything literally. But then we also know the Bhagavatam is poetry. It, it has many poetic elements in it. So do you think, specifically think now the Bhagavat here, if I look, I'm just sharing the screen, the Sanskrit is, he read them down to 21 times from the surface of the earth. So I don't know whether that is 21 generations, because that's what we have heard normally. But Trisaptaha Krutva Prutvim Krutva Nikshatriyam Prabhoho. So he made the earth Nikshatriya without Nikshatriya 21 times. Right. So what does that mean? Does he went around 21 times and destroyed Kshatriyas or he waited for 21 generations to come and as soon as generation was born, then he killed them. Then, it, then who was ruling all the time? It doesn't say that he was actually ruling. Somebody has to be ruling, isn't it? Also. It's very unclear, isn't it? Yeah. Well, of course, Brahmins could rule if they have to. Yeah, that's true. So, it said that in the Mahabharata, Ramayana also it is said that when Dashrath Maharaj dies in separation from Ram and none of his sons are there, so Vishwamitra officiates as the king during, not Vishwamitra, Vashishtha Muni officiates as the king during that time till Bharat mm. comes back. So Brahmanas could rule. But, uh, so, so you know, there is a literal reading, but is a literal reading essential? I wouldn't say that we have to take it non-literally, but if somebody wants to take it non-literally, would you consider <laughs> that incompatible? Or un, or to make a stronger word, unfaithful. Hmm. Uh, to, would it be unfaithful to take it literally? To Is take it non-literally. To take it non-literally. To take it non-literally. Um, I don't think it has to be uh, because, <clears throat> as you said, uh, this is um, how to say. We want to take, as Srila Prabhupada said, uh, our, our literature from every angle of vision. We want to discuss from every angle of vision, from all, he said, from all angles of vision. Uh, so one angle of vision is a literal angle, you could say. Mm. But um, it's only one. There are uh, other possibilities. So in this case, I don't know what all the possibilities might be. Um, so to say, in different Puranas, and it might be helpful to uh, to know what some of those are. Um, there is another angle to this I wanted to bring up, this whole story, which, yeah, I I don't know maybe with some caution I should mention it, whether it's nourishing our devotion or not. But there's a book which I have here uh, by uh, scholar David Schulman called The King and the Clown in South Indian Myth and Poetry. And in one section, he is discussing this pastime. And he has two he summarizes two versions, or he translates two versions. 
One is the Bhagavatam version, hmm. uh, which he says is kind of one of the best in the sense of bringing it all together. Uh, but then he also gives an account from uh, the T Tamil poetry tradition. This is uh, something called the Kanchi Puranam. Okay. And it's apparently a kind of um, uh, Stala Purana of Kanchipuram as an explanation for or um, it's telling the story of Renuka specifically because there's a temple or there's a shrine dedicated to Renuka uh, within one of the larger temples, I forget whether it's the Vish, it's one of the large temples. So there's a shrine uh, dedicated to Renuka. And this story is telling this is telling the story in such a way to explain how she becomes a goddess. Oh, okay. And in effect, as I remember, uh, she requests blessing from, I believe it's Lord Shiva. Eventually it's Shiva who is giving blessing to Parasharam, according to this account, uh, to do all of this killing, which I thought is interesting because it kind of reflects the story of Ashvatthama. Yes, I saw the same thing. Tells, which he tells later. Um, but the main point I want to make is that uh, Shulman, in his discussion of the whole story, uh, taking both accounts and referring, re, um, referring to others. The way he reads it is that it's an expression of the sort of inner conflict in the Brahman Varna. And what he means by that is that on the one side, the Brahman is the embodiment of peacefulness, of um, ahimsa, his concern is with uh, self-realization, meditation, yoga, and so on. He is uh, nivritti marga, not pravritti marga. Hmm. But on the other side, uh, it seems to be always the case that the Brahman has to be engaged in the world, and specifically, what is his job? He's a priest. Okay. And he's a priest for what purpose? He's a priest uh, in service to the kings, or he is legitimizing the, the kings. He's empowering the kings mm. to use, uh, to, to use physical, uh, violence. But how does the Brahmin do this? He does this by performing rituals. And what is the specific ritual that he does is uh, the fire sacrifice. And what is the fire sacrifice? Essentially, in the Vedic tradition, it involves the sacrifice of animals. And so the Brahmin is implicated in violence. Now, of course, there's the whole, um, how this is explained. You can say, well, it's not actually killing uh, because if the Brahmin does it properly, then uh, the, the animal is elevated and so on. Uh, sometimes those kinds of, uh, statements are taken as just justifications. The point is that uh, the position of the Brahman is, he's saying it's deeply conflicted. And that conflict is embodied in the person of Parashuram. Parashuram is a Brahman, but he is, he, uh, 
he shows the violent side of the Brahman to the total extreme, to the radical extreme, to the, you know, beyond all compare. And that's, uh, this highlights, therefore, uh, the sort of tenuous position of the Brahman, the, the problematic nature of being a Brahman. You want to be peaceful, but you can't really be peaceful because, um, well, you have, to, you have to be maintained somehow. And who's going to maintain you? It's going to be some king. And that's going to involve some violence. Mm. That's that's a quite a serious analysis that he is doing. In my, I was reminded that Prabhupada says that for our movement we wanted we want Brahmanas with the Kshatriya spirit. So in one sense that is our challenge also. So we would like to just maybe study scripture, teach scripture, but we have to get involved in management. We have to get involved in like counseling and dealing with people's practical problems. Mm. So I never heard that, that he said that specifically, Brahmins with Kshatriya spirit. That's interesting. Oh, really? I mean, I, I've heard it many times. I, I'll check with the reference. Okay. So, yeah, so what, the expression that I've heard is that if you only ha- have a Brahman, if you're only Brahmanas, you'll be satisfied just by, okay, so you'll just, you give a class. If people come, good. If people don't come, doesn't matter. So Brahmanas don't have like an active <laughs> desire to change the world. If it changes, right. it's well and good. If it doesn't happen, okay, <laughs> they are contented. So on the other hand, yeah. if it's only Kshatriyas, then the connection with transcendence is lost. You get too caught in uh, changing the world. So yeah, I thought this Brahmana, the Kshatriya spirit actually is, we could say a Vedic way of expressing that. Is it a biblical saying, be in this world, but not of the world? Yeah. Well, then with getting back to Parashram, with Parashram, it seems to get out of hand. Okay. That's true. <laughs> but the explanation is that this was necessary because the Kshatriyas were out of hand. Hmm. There's another element here which I uh, kind of, yeah, I think it might be relevant. Uh, the and going back to where this happens, it's it's said to uh, the the blood bath happens at Kurukshetra, right? And so the Samanta Panchaka, the five lakes created, which were created from this blood from the twenty one uh, generations of uh, Kshatriyas. Mm, is sort of all collected in this one place, which then at the time of the Kurukshetra War, uh, by that time, I guess it's transformed into water. But the Kurukshetra War is a sort of re-enactment of the same thing. And it's mentioned in the Mahabharata, as far as I know, that the war was a kind of rana yagna. It was a it was a, a sacrifice, a battle sacrifice, and the battle sacrifice meant blood is being shed, and this blood is what is being offered in the sacrifice. And it's being offered, instead of being offered up to the devas, it's being offered down to the earth. That's beautiful. And we usually think, you know, of the earth as mother earth, and she is very benign. But it seems that she also sometimes wants to drink blood. (laughs) Yeah. You know, nature is both benign as well as I don't want to use the word cruel, but harsh we could say or whatever. And there is that mm. verse which she says that Bhumi is laughing at those kings who think that they own the earth. They say oh, their names will also not remain, and they 
the earth will continue on so that aspect is yeah. there you know i have read yeah. what you said about the kurukshetra war being a, a sacrifice that 424 in the bhagavad gita brahma arpanam brahma havir brahma agna brahmana hutam so that is the sixth part mm. of the section where krishna talks about how everything can be seen as a yagya how fasting is a yagya how yoga is a yagya so there yeah. one of the gita commentator says that krishna is telling arjuna to see the kurukshetra war as a yagya and in this mm-hmm. he says that you are the you are the priest and you are a gandiva is like the sacrificial ladle and the ghee that is going to be offered <laughs> yeah. is the heads of the kauravas and this whole what do you say the kuruk <laughs> the kurukshetra battlefield is the whole battlefield is like a yagya sthali so where the the sacrificial pit or sacrificial arena so so this is fascinating that uh, this is kurukshetra war like a reenactment yeah we could also say that both are if both are dharma yuddha they are fought for establishing dharma then it it is it can also be said to be reenactment in that sense i guess the question in in my mind because we see i mean repeatedly in prabhupad's purports and in his preaching in general uh especially when there's talk about yuga dharma and about sacrifice uh he takes every opportunity to say the the form of sacrifice for this age is sankirtan right mm. and then he'll sometimes he'll often give the the maha mantra and in particular we chant this mantra and um what sort of bothers me is that in the vedic sacrifice if we're saying that this is okay look at it this way um th- it's often said that the upanishads are about the internalization of the sacrifice that the sacrifice is turned inward yeah and with the sacrifice being turned inward there's the violence is also turned inward in other words uh the practice of austerity hmm is a kind of violence going going further back to the vedic sacrifice um i've read that i've read an account uh that's explaining uh the uh shatapata brahmana that it's not only animals that are killed in a sacrifice but if animals are substituted with grains hmm uh even that the, the words used are about killing the the grain is killed uh the the soma is killed in the process of uh grinding it uh and squeeze you know extracting the the liquid it's referred to as killing so what is being where is the killing in the sankirtan yagya that's beautiful if you can well i don't know if it's beautiful but i'm wondering yeah. no, is no, it beautiful in the sense we that? just say it, is it that we are just we are killing material desire maybe yeah that's what i thought so because if you see in the past of jagai and madai when lord chaitanya is about to lop off the head of madai nityan pro says you are patita pavan and uh, so in this age you are not come to kill the kill the sinful people you are come to kill the sinful desires ah uh. so, so we could say that sankirtan uh my understanding was always sankirtan the offering is the consciousness and just as say the animal is offered a sacrifice and the animal evolves in a higher body so like that our consciousness is offered in the sacrifice of sankirtan and the consciousness emerges purified so in that sense the impurities are burnt away or because the consciousness evolves or emerges transformed so the so you could say the killing is the impurities 
Now there is the example Sanki. Where is the fire of Sankirtan? Is often that metaphor is used. Yeah. So then and I the thought first... in the eleventh canto there is a the metaphor of how gold and fire. You know when gold. I think the process of purification is compared to that. This is gold mm. when placed in fire comes out brighter. So when the soul goes through the fire of tribulation, if I or through the fire of purification, basically emerges emerges brighter. So we could say that fire can be sankirtan yagya. And cheto darpana marginam. That verse uh, yeah. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur says is uh, describing the seven. What is it? The seven tongues of the fire. Seven prong sacrifice. Seven prongs or seven tongues. Seven tongues, I think. Yeah. Okay, so we can say that's where the violence goes. Yeah. So I, the I violence like goes in destroying the material. Sorry. Now, when I said beautiful, my point was that actually the idea of I never thought that much about violence. Even austerity is a form of violence. But we could say it is a, it is a violence that is leading to something good. We it is a violence against the body's say default impulses, through which the body's desires become more disciplined. So, and I think the austerity the word is also tapa. Tapa is also fire. Yes, so, tapa is heat. Yeah, tapa is heat. Yeah. So that's a. I never thought of that consistent connection of uh, violence in that sense. This is that's it's a beautiful contemplation, actually. Well, you see it uh, go a step further. Uh, the internalization of the sacrifice in the Jain tradition, and I think that's where uh, the Vaishnavas become critical of the Jains because of their extreme austerities, um, going too far um, to the point of yeah, a kind of self-destruction. Or what's what's regarded as a kind of self self destructions uh, destruction of her personhood. So Vai, Vaishnavism seems to <clears throat> go with a kind of uh, spirit of moderation at the same time, like Krishna is saying to Arjuna in the Gita, "Yukta hara vihara sya yukta cheshtasya karma su yukta." Cheshtasya karma, yukta svapnava bodhisya, bodhasya yoga bhavati dukkha. Um, don't overdo it, whatever it is. And he also talks about too much eating and too much sleeping um, and so on. Moderation is somehow a virtue. And getting back to Parasharam, therefore, I, I find it. Fascinating that we celebrate Parasharam as one of, not just one of the avatars, I, and I think he's usually considered as a Shakti Avesha avatar, uh, but as one of the ten avatars, one of the major ones, because he is so completely off, off the charts <laughs> with his, with his behavior in so many ways. Mm. It, terms of his violence. So it's very interesting. It's just to continue this point about off the charts violence. It also seems that he recognizes the excesses. So for example, first when he kills Kartivir Arjuna, I think his father tells him that he should do some atonement. And he does yeah. atonement. And then yes, after he that, goes away for a year. Yeah. <laughs> he, he does, he does, uh, Tirtha Yatra for one year purification. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that his uh, the Kartir Arjuna's sons don't come immediately to try to get even. They wait till he's come back. Maybe they are just recovering from the shock or consolidating their forces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then after that, also, after he finishes the whole thing, it said that he gives the earth in charity to the Brahmanas, then yes. almost he renounces his weapons, and again he performs austerities. So, yes. So in that sense, violence is considered necessary and while it is happening, it is glorified. But afterward, there is also a recognition that uh, there is some kind of excesses that may happen and therefore some rectification has to be done. Hmm. 
Yes, it's, uh, I guess it's the violence of the surgical operation. Oh, so then you can have the pain, pain medication or something like that afterward. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there we get to also the point of, um, of authorized and unauthorized violence. So in the, in the analogy of the, the medical doctor, the surgeon, he, is, he or she is qualified uh, by training how to make the incisions in just the right way for the sake of the patient. Yeah. So we could say when the Lord or his representatives are doing it, or the Kshatriyas within the Dharmic Yuddha are doing it, then in a righteous war, then, then they are authorized. Hmm. Mm. This also yes, and also, also the Brahmin is doing whatever he has to do. Um, he's authorized because of proper training. Hmm. Yes, Maharaj. Now, there's one issue over here. It might open a Pandora's box, and if you don't want to, we can discuss separately. Uh, <laughs> now, this one point I had in mind is that sometimes devotees equate Prabhupada's position about democracy with some sound bites like demon crazy. But uh, we do see in the Vedic times, if a king becomes tyrannical, there are systems for removing that king. And one of the systems is that hmm. the Brahmanas are very powerful. And yeah. the Brahmanas can just chant mantras like Vena, the Brahmanas can actually take weapons and overpower the Kshatriyas. Hmm. So when that is not possible for, or if that, they can't do that, they can directly appeal to the Lord and the Lord descends. So, which mm. is, so when that is not possible, accessible for us today, and on top of that, a prediction of Kali Yuga is that the kings are likely to become predators. The kings are likely to become thieves and plunderers. So then, isn't it better to have a system we, of governance which has some uh, you could say more robust or more human level of checks and balances. So mm. it's not necessarily that democracy is the best form of government in all times, but in today's world, given the situation, three things, the likelihood of the Kings becoming uh, tyrannical, the unavailability of the traditional forms of checks and balances and the yeah. presence of a system of government with say finite tenure and within democracy, which at least brings some amount of regulation. So I'm not sure. So I'm not, you could say I'm not defending democracy, but I would say, I don't want to, I don't feel that we need to demonize democracy saying that it is, it is something which is to be dismissed. Any thoughts on this? Um, well, that is a bigger topic, isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And I'm no political scientist, uh, but it, it is a subject I think about, uh, especially uh, in current troubled times, uh, especially with politics, the way they've been going in the country that I come from, yeah. America. Uh, <laughs> and what, what strikes me perhaps more than anything about this is Yes, some, as you say, a form of checks and balances, uh, which is on the human level seems necessary. But part of the checking and balancing uh, that seems essential, which is uh, unfortunately sometimes neglected, is checks of qualification of the leader by some form of training And what uh, comes what comes to my mind here um, as a possible indicator of what could be done comes from ancient China. Now, on the one side, China is this he very heavy-handed, uh, you know, system of control from the top, but they had this system of examinations where anyone who wanted to work in the government had to pass 
a very difficult examination. And I think there were three different levels of that. Uh, but people would spend their years and years studying for that examination, which included a lot of um, qualifications of culture. They had to know, um, you know, classical literature, poetry. They had, they had to be very cultured people. And okay. the criticism that I see... That, Prabhupada's criticism of democracy is that it ends up with um, Vaishyas and Shudras being in charge <laughs> instead of uh, Brahmins and Kshatriyas. And I think what we would want to reflect on is how could that be guaranteed that those... Mm, those who are uh, voted into a position have properly demonstrated their qualifications. In other words, you'd have a, a process of preliminary qualification and then maybe voting for them uh, amongst those who have proven their qualification. Mm. I don't know. That makes sense. Some, some way to overcome uh, what we have seen, and I think we really did see this in America, where you had someone uh, being voted as the as the leader of the whole country, who, I mean, in so many ways was really not qualified for the post. <laughs> just, you know, he just was not qualified. He was a, a, a Vaisha at best. And uh, I mean, aside from his other uh, characteristics, it's very, the fact that he became, anyway, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I think that's a big subject. But this question about this Chinese system, was it for the administrators or the politicians? Because even in India, there is an elaborate system of examination for the administrators, but there's no such, yeah. no such thing for the politicians actually. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have politicians as such in China. You had rulers. And I don't know to what extent the examination system went up. I think it was, as you say, mainly for administration. But it, uh, what occur occurs to me is that um, such a system, if properly developed, could include also the... Yeah, what we now call the politicians. Oh. They need to show their qualification. One thing I've seen, um, it's maybe just uh, accidental, but I, I noticed some years ago that it was quite common that politicians in the country of Austria, uh, which is next to Germany, it's a small country, but it seemed quite common that I would see in posters when we were traveling, preaching in Austria, uh, when, a, when an election was coming up, um, you'd see the posters of the competing politicians. And many of them had the title of doctor. They had some, you know, educational higher qualification. Interesting. Um, now we have uh, the, the first lady in America uh, has, has, a, has a PhD in education. Yeah. And uh, there was an interesting exchange on the New York Times, I read, um, that uh, someone was pu putting her, her down, uh, that she was um, She's not identifying yet. herself in that way. And then there was a huge reaction uh, against the critic uh, as, as being, um, you know, sort of misogynist and whatever else. So I thought that's interesting uh, that now, now it's kind of been accepted. Okay, yes, actually she is, she is a, you know, educated person. We respect that. <laughs> yeah. 
it seems that at least in america quite often when people have a doctorate which is not a medical doctorate they put it as a phd after the name they don't always put it like a doctor before that's why i think the controversy was there so normally when you introduce yourself would you call yourself as dr kenneth valpi or just can how do you put it if you have a phd it depends very much on the context in okay. in general i would say we don't uh we don't use either you you it's it's um you know it's just kind of understood you have the degree but uh it okay. depends you okay. may you know in your signature line you'll have it and so on but okay but sense. if you see if you see a book hmm. um you know you see a lot of self help books and there will be some psychologist um and on the front cover will be his name um doctor so and so or else so and so phd you know immediately that that is not an academic book really that's fascinating okay so if you are to because like, an academic book you would never put your title on the uh, on the front that's fascinating so, so it's presumed that you will be having a title if you are to put it that means there is something uh, something uh, odd over there okay yeah that's interesting okay let's say now i think about it none of the books i have seen you put that to phd's just a straight name is there yeah that's yeah. true so we have anyway just yes, matter to conclude so just that last point is is parshuram as we will probably talk about this in the future avatars he is among the few avatars who appears in along with many other avatars he will appear yes. with ram he will appear with krishna and he yeah i don't think he appears with kalki but it said that he is still living yeah so maybe we'll revisit him in a future discussion maharaj yes <laughs> so maharaj ram is always with us <laughs> <laughs> you can say he is somehow he is not worshiped so much as a protector like narsimha dev is narsimha dev is fierce parshuram is also fierce but maybe parshuram doesn't yeah. have one particular devotee so the devotee cannot identify so much with like we can identify yeah. with allah than his prayers parshuram doesn't have one particular devotee Yes, Apparently, Renuka is worshipped more in South India. Oh, is it? I don't know more, but uh, there are shrines uh, to Renuka. That's fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I was just, just before I talk. I was googling Parshuram temples. There are a few, but not a large number. Hmm. Certainly nowhere near, say, Ram or Krishna. Yes, my friend. No, of course not. <laughs> So should I try to summarize Maharaj quickly please do your Let's expert how, how much we can so we started today by discussing about you you started with the the shautar stotra and how jayadev goswami seems to be the his introduction is almost emphasizing the greatness of the lord through the shautar and then he goes into sweetness so it's a different mood which he sets over there and he is the person who seems to have popularized the idea of the shautaras and popularized this particular list as the primary 10 avatars and then we discussed how there's a glorification of violence and we try to understand it from different perspectives so you discuss i talked about rivers of blood and uh, you say heads rivers of blood flowing and heads rolling as you said so there is a celebratory tone towards the violence so then it's not exactly horror and is it virya it is maybe it's de- it's depicting the heroism of the warriors uh, and then we discuss the context here the kshatriyas have become brutal to some extent and when the protectors become predators then we discuss three other incidents also like arjuna showering arjuna causing rivers of blood when uh, jayadrat is to be reached and the whole kaurava army is in between then that is of course celebrated and it's a just cause because abhimanyu has been killed then you talk about ashwatthama that time also there is a lot of brutal violence but then that is talked about in a uh, it is considered reprehensible in the epic itself and he is cursed for that so that is if any violence in the epics is comparable to say modern 
terrorist, terrorist religious violence, it would be Ashwatthama's kind of killing. And then the Khandava killing is, it's, it seems to be anti-environment, but then if you see the bigger picture, that they are demoniac beings over there who are being, uh, who are being removed. Then we talked about violence as a part of the uh, <clears throat> cultural, it's, the violence is described in the epics, but along with that, if you look at the broader context, then the, 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 there's somebody who seems to be the aggressor, but the actual aggression started with someone else. And we discussed that in terms of Parshuram's killing of the Kshatriyas later. So then we started the story with this uh, Sage Ruchika and uh, how there was the exchange of the oblations because of which <clears throat> Gadi's daughter Satyavati, she got a grandson who would be a Kshatriya. So Jethur Jamadagi Kshatriya was born. And then you mentioned the point about how two things that the overreaction to, of, uh, to Renuka's mistake. So, and that seems to be Jav Jamadagni has just instructed Parshuram to be forgiving after he killed Karthi Rajuna, and then he himself seems to be unforgiving. So, we discussed in general, it seems that it was, uh, it seems to be the ethical codes were quite strict against women. So I talked about the Ahalya story, how there was a moment of weakness on her part. You mentioned in the Israeli, in the Israeli, uh, in Israel, there was a stoning of women for adultery. Then I also mentioned about how eventually, like say some characters might be portrayed in unflattering roles to glorify some other characters. So this might be less a, a sort of anger of Jamadagni as a glorification of the presence of mind and his of Parshuram and his faith in his father's prowess. Then you talked about how Parshuram goes about killing so 21 generations. We said you could take it literally or in a different perspective. And it was a striking correlation that you made that Prabhupada said we should study from all angles of view. And so the literal could be one angle and other angles could be there also. And then you quoted that academic scholar who says that Parshuram represents at an extreme level the inner conflict between the Kshat, within the Brahmanas, who at one level want to be just uh, renounced doing meditation and yoga, but then they are also priests who have to do animal sacrifices. And so in that sense, the tension which is there, that may express itself sometimes. So one expression of that is here in terms of uh, Parshuram killing, but then even when he kills, both occasions, first he does atonement, second time he does atonement, so although that, so even though he's killing, we could say it is, it is right, it, it, it is to some extent righteous because uh, Kartivir Arjun's sons did not really stop. They, they killed his father and then they, they killed his brother. They, they were brutal. So he had to rid the, rid the world of them. But still there was a recognition that this is not to be done excessively. So if he has gone excessively, he does atonement. And then you talk about a Samantha Panchak and then in Kurukshetra seems to be a reenactment of the same fight uh, that is there. Or, and uh, there talked about how instead of the sacrificial offering going up through Agni, it is going down to the earth, in this case, in the form of blood. And then so the earth is both benign as well as, uh, as, well as harsh in some situations. And then that also can be related to the Bhagavad Gita verse 424 about the whole yagya being in various forms. Then we talked about, you, know, the, you said the Upanishads manifest the internalization of violence in the form of austerities. And then... The, uh, yeah, the internalization of the sacrifice, they usually okay, say. Okay, so sacrifice, sorry, not sac sacrifice. So internalization of the sacrifice. And then, so the violence is manifested in the form of austerities. And then in Sankirtan, so Sankirtan is also the form of sacrifice this time. So where is the sacrifice? Where is, is the violence over here? So you could say it's the, it's the violence in terms of the killing of the impurities within the heart. So just as gold gets purified, Lord Chaitanya is, is told by Nityan Prabhu that you are the killer of not demons, but demoniac desires. And then we had this re brief reflection about, uh, about, I think you mentioned the Chinese in two different contexts. First was earlier about the limits of obedience. So was Parshuram being like uncritically, blindly obedient to 
his father was ram being blindly obedient to dashrath so we discussed that aspect and then later he mentioned about checks and balances so here if if kings go bad they had we could say supernatural intervention either by brahmanas having mystical powers or calling to the invoking the higher beings including supreme lord so when we don't have that a system with some human checks and balances maybe maybe reasonable but then you made the point was that it's not so much after a person comes to power to have checks and balances more important is before the person comes to power can they can there be some means of training so that they have some qualifications so if that is so then we discuss about chinese chinese system briefly about having exams and when there is qualification then there's there's qualification training then there's lesser likelihood of maybe the person the king ruler going bad and then we concluded by talking about how parashuram is avatar who will appear in along with the future avatars also among the few few of avatars is like that any points yeah. you want to add or you think i left out maharaj um <clears throat> no i think you covered everything we might just end by inviting wh- whoever is listening and watching to think about how you might compose a prayer uh to lord parashuram what would be your way of glorifying parashuram and what kind of blessing would you want to have from lord parashuram <laughs> that's a beautiful thought you know, actually i never thought of it this time you started with a prayer and you're also ending with a prayer so <laughs> the thought that came in my mind is something maybe you could also say that it's something like whatever power we have we all have the tendency to abuse that power the kshatriyas mm. are abusing that power so you know i can say that i have some intellectual ability i would tend to abuse that to put down other devotees or to put down those who don't agree with me so you can pray that he destroy their tendencies within us to abuse yeah. whatever power we have mm. very good swaraj <laughs> and next time we meet uh, we can look forward to discussing lord rama rama yes, chandra sir. definitely i look who, forward to that who in some ways uh, i think of as just the opposite of parashuram <laughs> oh i never I mean, thought like that yes he's 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 an actual kshatriya but he has this sublimely uh, sweet nature yeah oh that way yes kshatriya with immense restraint although he yeah. fights but his yeah. grace and restraint amidst adversity that's what defines yeah. him yes yeah, yeah. so it's dramatically opposite yeah so true yes i look forward to that thank you very much for your association and thank for you. the turning of the heart and the churning of the bhagavatam meditating on the lord's various manifestations thank you <laughs> hare krishna thank you. Hare Krishna Gaur Prem Anand Hari Bol Hari Bol